Welcome everybody. This is our fifth and final um, webinar in the Connect the Heartland series um, through Heartland Rewilding, the partnership between the Rewilding Institute, the Half Earth Project, and Project Coyote. Um, we have with us today a wonderful speaker. He's our very own Project Coyote Science Advisor team member, John Visevich. Oh my gosh, I practiced so many times and I still messed it up. I'm so sorry, John. No, you're perfect. Anyway. <laughs> Gotta love us Midwesterners, right? We feel bad. Um, anyways, John has a great presentation. Um, he spent so much time working with wolves. Um, as he was telling me earlier, um, he's kind of was destined to work with them. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to John with just a slight reminder. Please post any and all questions in the chat uh, or not in the chat, but the Q and A. Um, that is where we will be pulling from. And if we don't get them all answered in the Q&A session at the end, I will be saving them and we'll have John answer some and do a follow up. This will also be recorded. So if you have to drop out or if you want to share it with somebody, we should have that recording out on our YouTube channel in about a week. All right, John, go ahead and talk to him. Yes, my goodness. Well, th thank you for the very, very kind introduction. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for, for sharing an hour of your day. Uh, this is a great a privilege for, for me. Um, you know, let me just kind of introduce myself uh, for those of you who, who may not know me. Um, my name is John Vucetij. I'm a professor at Michigan Technological University, a science advisor for Project Coyote. Um, I've studied wolves all over the world. Um, but, but probably most importantly about my professional life, I've spent about 30 years uh, studying wolves and moose that live on Isle Royal National Park. And the research there is the longest study of any predator prey system in the world. It's been going on for more than six decades. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I've been with the project for, for about 30 years. And the centerpiece of the project has always been the same, which is to count the number of wolves and to count the number of moose that's done in the winter time from a small aircraft where, from which we do the surveys. And the purpose of doing that has been to understand how and why the wolf and moose populations fluctuate over time. Sometimes there's more wolves, sometimes fewer, sometimes there's more moose, sometimes fewer. We try to sort out why. Is are the wolves determining how many uh, moose there are, or vice versa, or a little bit of bit of both. Well, so because of all the time that I spent on Isle Royale, I decided a few years ago to uh, to write a book about my experiences there. Uh, the book is uh, a little bit memoir. Uh, it's a little bit uh, notes from the field. It's a little bit of natural history about wolves and moose. It's a little bit about the science on Isle Royale. And um, what I'd like to do today is just share with you some readings from that book. The book is called um, uh, Restoring the Balance. And um, I'll tell you more about the, the book itself uh, in, in just a little bit. But I, I think we'll just get started with, with a reading from the book. Um, and again, what you need to know for the context here is that this is from the first chapter. The first chapter is entitled Why Wolves? And this particular reading is a set of notes that came from some observations that we made from the small aircraft that, I'm, uh, that I mentioned a little while ago. The small aircraft has a pilot that sits in front and then one observer, that's me or my one of my colleagues, that sits right behind and uh, the wings are over top of this airplane. So when you look out the window, you can see the ground beneath you on, on either side. And it's really quite, uh, quite a privileged way to be able to see what's happening. So here it is, February 18th. 2012. Last night, the wolves of Chippewa Harbor Pack crossed the Greenstone Ridge to hunt in remote corners of their territory. By morning, they were traveling back to the core of their territory. Shortly after we caught up with them, not far from Little Todd Harbor, we watched them change course abruptly and straight into the wind. We saw what they smelled, a cow moose and her calf who had, who had themselves been foraging. It didn't look good for the cow and calf right from the beginning. The cow was too far away from her mother, and they may have had different ideas about how to handle the situation. The wolves rushed in. The cow turned to face the wolves, expertly positioned between the wolves and her calf, but only for a second. The calf bolted. After a flash of confusion, the cow pivoted and did the same. Had she not, 
The wolves would have rushed past the cow and bloodied the snow with her calf. The break in coordination between the cow and the calf put four or five wind-thrown trees between the cow and her tender love. The cow hurled herself over partially fallen trunks. She caught up with her frantic calf before the wolves did. Then the chase was on, led by the least experienced of them all, the calf. The cow, while capable of running faster, stayed immediately behind the calf, no matter what direction the terror-ridden mind of that calf decided to take. Every third or fourth step, the cow snapped one of her rear hooves back towards the teeth of death. One solid knock to the head would rattle the life from any hound from hell. After a couple of minutes and perhaps a third of a mile, the pace slowed. By the third minute, everybody was walking. The cow, the calf, and the wolves. The stakes were high for all, but not greater than the exhaustion that they shared. Eventually, they all stopped. Not a hair's width separated the cow and the calf, and the wolves were just 20 feet away. The cow faced the wolves. A few minutes later, the wolves walked away. By nightfall, Chippewa Harbor Pack had pushed on another six miles or so, passing who knows how many more moose. Their stomachs remained empty. And then a little bit further on in the same chapter, towards the end of the chapter, it says, in a typical year, most moose on Isle Royal are tested by wolves about once a month. No moose fails more than once, and most moose eventually fail the test. They die from circulatory shock, hypervolemia, insufficient blood pressure in the brain, or injury to some other vital organ, all preceded by an ocean of exhaustion, a lifetime of anxiety compressed into a moment held by a fast and shallow heartbeat, a light and vertiginous feeling in the head brought on by low blood pressure, and a disassociating numbness that is a true gift offered by a cocktail of endogenous biochemicals and suggestive that evolution may be more compassionate, if only by accident, than her reputation. Teeth, swinging hooves, bloody snow, spinning sky, faintness, a once proud and still massive shoulder hitting the ground hard, the tearing of flesh, fading, and then nothing. Now, now the due reasoning and rationalization begins. We try to squirm away from easier thoughts. He was about to die anyway. He might have lived a bit longer, but his quality of life would have been so poor. We might even tell the story by replacing the pronoun he and his with it and its. We reason that the only other option is death by starvation or infection that spreads from jaw necrosis which happens to be another common cause of death for moose and isle royal. We think mercy killing, but there's no reasoning here and little rationale for picking one horrible end over the other. We pivot for other escape routes. Wolves keep the moose population healthy by killing the weakened moose. To some limited extent, sure. In any case, these are all excuses for absolution for failing to give tragedy its due attention. These excuses diminish the majesty of a moose's life and the depth of his or her suffering. Excuses obscure the horror of the death and the celebration of a dangerously brave life. They hide persistence to the point of absolute exhaustion, the extension of one life by the taking of another, and transformations of tissue and energy from one species to another, processes that have occurred each moment over the past billion years. Excuses conceal the flash ignited by the mundane smashing into the divine. Now, our Paleolithic ancestors, they were the first in the history of all life to imagine the circumstance of their providers. That vital juxtaposition between living and dying demanded reconciliation. So we developed ceremonies and rituals. Religion was born along with our capacity to imagine the circumstance of our victims. We no longer care for those primitive observances. Warm, pumping, bloody muscle is reduced to meat that is stored in lockers, packaged into casings, and formed into patties. We eat, live, and kill without a thought. Why wolves? Because they remind us to think. 
And so that's a, a reading from the first chapter of the book. And the book is organized, as I mentioned, uh, well, I'll say a little bit more specifically, there's a first chapter that's about wolves. Uh, the next chapter is is about moose, and I'll, I'll share a reading from, from that chapter about moose. This chapter about moose is also a little bit autobiographical about myself and how it is that I came to, to do the work on Isle Royal. You need to know a few bits to make the context uh, sensible. The first thing for you to know is that ticks, especially on Isle Royal National Park, um, are affected by some, or I'm sorry, moose that are in Isle Royal National Park are affected by a, a species of tick. Tick is very unusual, at least unusual to our usual way of thinking about ticks. They're active only in the winter time. Their life cycle goes roughly something like this. They're on the moose in the winter time. They mate at the end of the winter, the ticks do. The females with their eggs drop off of the moose in the springtime. They burrow into the soil, they lay their eggs, and the eggs stay there all summer long. In the fall time, the eggs hatch, the little nymph ticks crawl to the tops of grasses in about October, and they wait on those grasses until a moose comes by, and when a moose comes by, they latch on, and then that's how they uh, continue their life cycle, and then the, the next winter goes on. The other thing that's important about these ticks is that one moose can have uh, well over 100,000 ticks. And so it can really impact a moose's well-being in a pretty serious way. It uh, may only in rare circumstances straight up cause the death of a moose, but it sure can contribute to the death of a moose because the greatest impact of these ticks is at the late winter and early spring when moose are already having kind of a tough time because there's not so much food because the greenness of summer hasn't happened. The next thing you need to know for context here is that it's our interest to kind of document how many ticks there are from one year to the next. And we do this, I think, kind of cleverly with photography because the, the ticks can lead to hair loss of the moose. And so if you can get a nice photograph that's like a profile of the moose, you can see the how big an area of the moose's hide basically has lost its hair. If you take enough photographs of enough different moose throughout the spring, you can kind of get a sense of, oh, well, this was a better than average year as far as the tick loads were or worse than average kind of a year, that sort of thing. And so in what I'm about to read to you, I was uh, camping near a swamp. Um, that explains the footwear that I have on because my tent was very close by. That'll make sense in a moment. And I was just waiting for a moose to come by to a, thought that, to a place that I thought they would come. Um, Oh, maybe one more detail here to give all the natural history so that it all makes good sense. The reason that we know the moose come to this spot, and that's a good place to take photographs, is because there's a mineral spring here where water kind of percolates right through the soil. That mineral water is high in, in sodium and other minerals. And moose, like other ungulates, have a real strong uh, yearning for those minerals in the springtime. It's basically the same idea as why a white-tailed deer will come to a salt block. And so, uh, and so the, the moose literally kind of slurp the mud in the water in some of these areas to, to get these minerals. So with that, we can get into the, into the reading. So I sit behind the sh camera shutter waiting for a moose to offer a complete profile of the hair loss on their left side and then the right side. But much of the time is just waiting for moose. By early afternoon, the morning chill has dissolved into a light delirium induced by a tincture of swamp quietude and a bright, brilliant spring sun. Tired of sitting, I reposition and take a turn standing. Well, less standing and more draped over the tripod of my camera. Then a peculiar sensation, a little push from beneath the sole of my crock, worn thin from the wilderness. I straighten up, feigning to myself that I had been alert. Was I already that bored with standing? Whatever. I shifted my weight and returned to a hazier state of mind. Last summer's swamp sedges, dead and desiccated, stand tall and rustle in a light breeze. Green shoots are still only an accent to the beige hues of early spring. I stand right at the swamp's edge, where the soil is soft with moisture but not saturated. Nothing particularly advantageous about this position, except being just dry enough to keep the water from percolating through the pinhole in the bottom of my crock. Again, that same funny sensation on the bottom of my foot. I shift weight again. With a third push, 
I compare the observation against ideas, suggesting the various ways by which I could be losing my faculties. I'm not hungry, not really hungry, just bored hungry. The six-year-old in me is tired of standing. The grown-up in me isn't going to reposition so soon after my last repositioning. Then comes another push. Exasperated, I abandon my post in a huff, taking one step aside, get down on my knees, push the grass aside, and meet the pointed nose of a baseball-sized toad. She had been pushing her head up against my thin-soled shoe with all the force she could muster with a toad push-up. Eye contact was unavoidable. I do not know the limits of toad cognition, and I fully expect that I'm projecting the thought, but she seems to have been disgusted in wondering whether I'm more ignorant than insensitive or the other way around. Now, a year before, at the same swamp, in the same disordered state of mind, a thought occurred to me. I hadn't been looking for thoughts. Nevertheless, the autonomous narrator in my head proffered one. I was sitting in the wilderness counting what was left of the day's allotments of M&Ms. And then, how many other moose does a moose know? Then the words, is it boring to chew cud for eight hours of every day? I wondered, what is it like to be a moose? These questions were not warned with sentimentality. No, they struck me cold and horrifying. Because let's say that you selected 100 people at random from all parts of the world and all walks of life. No, make that 100 million people, line them up in order from the most to least knowledgeable about moose. I would be pretty close to the front of that line but I had no idea how to answer those questions. Soon afterward, I realized that moose are not merely alive, but that each moose has a life. A moose has memories of yesterday, hopes for tomorrow, joys and fears, and a story to be told. If a moose has a life, so I reasoned with the awesome powers of deduction that I acquired from all those years in school, then I bet a wolf has a life too. This gift of awareness was first presented to me by an autonomous, by an anonymous mud-sucking moose. And I regifted it back to you in chapter one when we imagined the dreams of a wolf, which is a part of chapter one I didn't read to you. If wolves and moose have lives, then the chickadee and the squirrel that live in town just outside our houses, they have lives too. Being less familiar with the details of their lives in no way diminishes the fact. And those miserable ticks, they have lives too. Our minds are so obstinately anchored to our own experiences and perspectives so much more than we appreciate. It feels awkward to say, but I owe those ticks gratitude. They led me to this mud hole on a warm spring day where in a mild state of delirium, I wondered for the first time, are the thoughts of a moose beyond my imagination? And so that's the second um, reading that I'll share with you from the second chapter, which is mostly about moose and a little bit about my autobiography. And the book proceeds to uh, tell the history of the science that occurs on Isle Royal. And one of the things that's uh, useful to know about that actually goes all the way back to, um, well, it actually goes back to probably prehistory. There's this idea known as balance of nature my colleague who uh, led the project before I did, he wrote a book about his experiences on the island and he called it a broken balance. And you may have remembered the title of the book that I'm speaking about now is called Restoring the Balance. I'll tell you why it's called that in just a little bit. Um, but, but so much of our understanding about nature and about Isle Royal is kind of filtered through this lens of an idea that's known as balance of nature. Balance of nature uh, has a place in our mythologies. Balance of nature figures into kind of ancient Greek writings. Um, it was a key metaphysical idea for Darwin when he was developing his ideas about evolution. But then something different started to happen in the 20th century with this idea of balance of nature. In the 20th century, what we might now consider like modern science or contemporary science, 
that started to kind of investigate what balance of nature might mean. And it started with a person whose name was Vito Volterra. There's hardly a reason to know his name, except for maybe in just the context of what I'm going to share with you today. He was a mathematician, and he developed some theoretical models, some mathematical equations that made a prediction that predator and prey would exhibit a kind of balance, that they would kind of cycle up and down, oscillating over time forever, with the predator high at one moment and the prey low at the same moment, and then they would switch and go back and forth. Really a very elegant piece of math that had nice uh, kind of rationale behind it. But at the end of the day, and Volterra was doing this work in the 1920s, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of math. It's just an equation. And there was no real way to know if that's actually how nature worked. And so what happened in the decades that followed in the 1930s and 40s and 50s is people started doing experiments to see if they could, in laboratory environments, recreate the dynamics that were predicted by those equations. And so these experiments took place with little organisms that were microscopic, little invertebrates, both aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates that could take place in aquaria and, uh, and ter ter uh, terraniums. And those experiments were tantalizing because they definitely offered some interesting support for what Volterra, the mathematician had shown might be going on. Um, but they also raised more questions and they were all just like, well, that's fine, but that's what happens in a laboratory. But what about in, in real nature outside? And what's really important to understand is just as those experiments were really um, coming onto the scene, that's when Derwood Allen, who started the Wolf Moose Project on Isle Royal in 1959, that's when he started his work. And his motivation was exactly what we're speaking about now is to kind of understand, well, if you ha had a predator and a prey, and if they were stuck on an island, what would happen to them? Uh, how, would they persist? Uh, if so, how? That was his motivation. And it really was a motivation that was kind of strung to that history. And so one of the chapters in the book is uh, kind of covers the experiments that were done just prior to the wolf moose study. And they, they set the stage very nicely for, uh, for later chapters in the book. So I'm going to give you a reading from that. Um, so Volterra, he's the mathematician, shared his ideas with the world in a 1926 paper that concluded, it is to be hoped that this theory may receive further verification and may be of some use to biologists. But Volterra's hope was quickly pursued by the Russian ecologist Gregory Gauss. Now Gauss devised a clever way to evaluate the scene that Volterra had painted and whether it bore any resemblance to the real world. Wanting a fair evaluation and believing that most of nature was more complicated than Volterra's Spartan equations could convey, Gauss needed simple creatures in a simple environment. And to this end, Gauss enlisted two species of single cell creatures that we call ciliated protozoans. Entire populations of these little fellows can live out their lives in a test tube or petri dish of water. Ciliated protozoans are also easy to come by. They're found in just about any scoop of pond water. Ga Gauss selected Paramecium caudatum, which feeds on bacteria, and they represented the prey in his laboratory experiment. And Didinium nostatum, which feeds on the paramecium to represent the predator. To prepare the study, Gauss dumped some oatmeal in water and inoculated the mixture with bacteria. Soon the water teemed with bacteria. He strained the oatmeal from the water, leaving a bacteria rich broth. And then he poured less than a teaspoon of the broth into a test tube. These protozoans now, they live at the edge of our visibility. If you were to hold a glass of water filled with paramecia to the light, you would detect little flecks scooting about, but that's about all. You'd see a bunch of someones and you'd be able to count them, but you wouldn't be able to discern what they're up to. But if you could, then you'd know the potency of their lives. If you could look closely, you'd know how much authentic nature is happening in this Gaussian universe. To see the tooth and claw of Gauss's microcosm, we need a better view though. We need to shed the biased perspective we inherited with our gargantuan multicellular bodies. 
So we should make like Alice from Wonderland. Take a swig of that potion that's labeled drink me and watch ourselves shutting up like a telescope. Now this test tube is smaller than the rabbit hole, so we'd better take two swigs. And as quick as your imagination can conjure, that teaspoon of broth grows to the size of a large swimming pool. The water is littered with spheres, roughly the size, texture, and color of grapefruits. These are the many thousands of bacteria. Gauss has just dumped exactly 10 paramecia into the pool with us. The paramecia are shaped like fat cigars, about as long and large around as a slightly overweight human. Swim up and touch one. They're harmless. And you'll see that while they have shape, they're also pretty pliable. Their single cell bodies are covered with the strangest kind of shag carpet with fibers longer than any shag you've ever seen, though not nearly as dense. Well, a closer comparison might be a balding man in the habit of comb overs who's just jumped into the water. Those long waving hairs, they're the cilia. They pulse in unison, propelling, propelling each paramecium through the water in search of dense schools of bacteria. Now, if the bacteria are plentiful, one paramecium can consume about a hundred in an hour. And when a young paramecium eats as much as it likes, then in just five or six hours, about half of the paramecium's inside parts migrate to each end of its intercellular, uh, unicellular body and the cell membrane begins to contract in the middle and then pinches off. In a process that takes just a few moments where there had been one paramecium, we are now staring at two half-sized paramecia, each scoot off in their own direction in search of more bacteria. In 24 hours of being in the swimming pool, the population of 10 paramecia has increased to about 30. In 48 hours, it's hard to swim around without occasionally bumping into one. Our swimming pool is inhabited by now more than 100 paramecia. At this moment, Gauss drops three didinia, these are the predators, into our swimming pool. They are barrel shaped, slightly smaller than the paramecia, and agile owing to cilia emanating from two bands located where the quarter hoops of a hog's head of whiskey would be. You see sacs embedded in the translucent membranes that is their skin. Each of these cysts is packed with needle-like filaments. When a didinium detects a paramecium nearby, and I have no idea how they do it, these creatures have no eyes, no ears, no nerve cells of any kind because their entire body is just one cell. In any case, they eject those filaments penetrating into the paramecium's skin. Oh, wait, I forgot to mention the toxins. The filaments are coated with toxins to immobilize the paramecia and begin digesting its insides before the didinium has even swallowed it. The didinium retracts the filaments with the paramecium still attached and the paramecium may be folded in half as it's pulled into the didinium's mouth. Well, we should say mouth. The didinium had been smaller than the paramecium until it was stretched on from all sides from the inside by the freshly consumed prey. Ooh, watch out right behind you, there's a didinium. I wouldn't get too close to them. Now, paramecia are not helpless in all of this. They have similar sacs embedded in their skin. If triggered at the opportune moment, they foil the didinium's toxic filaments, sidelining the didinium from the hunt for 20 or 30 minutes as it regenerates its spent toxocysts. An especially skilled didinium captures and consumes about five paramecia a day, depending on how easily the next paramecium is found. When didinia have had enough to eat, they undergo, like their prey, the torturous looking process of binary fission. While this Gaussian universe is a laboratory experiment in a glass tube, don't overlook the raw peril and don't fail to appreciate the complexity. What happens next? after the paramecia increased and after the didinium increased. Nobody can know what is gonna happen and how it will turn out unless you keep watching. Within 24 hours of being dropped into the tank, those three didinia had consumed scores of paramecia, increased their own kind to about 25. The abundance of paramecia plummeted from more than 100 to about 35. A day later, the number of didinia held steady 
and the Paramecium population struggled against extinction. A day later, the Paramecia were extinct. The Didinia, now with nothing to eat, went extinct the following day. All that remained were bacteria feeding on Didinia carcasses. In addition to the miniaturized space of this tank, time passes differently here. You and I are accustomed to measuring time in hours and days, but life meters time with each passing generation, whose duration varies among the species. For humans, a generation is about 25 years. For moose, it's about nine years. For wolves, it's about four years. Gauss's evaluation lasted only six days. That may seem a flash, but those six days saw the passage of more than 20 paramecium generations. By comparison, six generations of wolf moose dynamics on Isle Royal is just 15 wolf generations. That's right, don't forget Isle Royal. The history of the balance of nature is worthy of attention for its own sake, but our particular interest is a rich understanding of Derwood Allen's declaration that the wolves and moose of Isle Royal had struck a reasonably good balance. And a reasonably good balance is how Derwood Allen described the dynamics between wolves and moose on Isle Royal in, um, in the 1960s. And he probably came to that conclusion because he didn't look for so long because he was right at the beginning of the project. And his predecessor in, in my I'm sorry, his successor and my predecessor, Rolf Peterson, he continued watching throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and to the present day, in fact. And, um, and what we all could see is that the wolf and moose populations, populations actually oscillated a great deal. Um, and one of the things that became of concern for myself and my colleague, Rolf Peterson, is that um, the population of wolves seemed to be quite at risk of extinction, this concern first came to us in the first decade of the 21st century. By about 2008 or nine, we were quite concerned about it. The concern had to do with the fact that the island is small. There's never very many wolves on the island. And so they're vulnerable to inbreeding. What we only started beginning to understand in the 21st century, and again, about the year 2007, 2008, 2009, is that the reason that inbreeding hadn't taken hold in the wolf population in prior decades is because occasionally a wolf would come from Canada, cross an ice bridge, they would mate and reproduce with the wolf population on Isle Royal. In doing so, they would infuse the population with new genes and in that way stave off inbreeding depression. That went on for many decades without really anyone fully appreciating it. We only started to appreciate it by basically kind of doing some, what you might call forensics DNA work. And we found basically traces of Canadian wolves in the Iowa wolf population that could only have gotten there by these migrants coming occasionally. And then what happened is that, in the, especially in the 21st century, is that ice bridges became less common. And when ice bridges became less common because of climate warming, it made for immigration events from Canada to the islands basically become non-existent. And then inbreeding depressions really took hold and uh, pushed the population of wolves on Isle Royale right to the brink of extinction. And about the year, I think it was 2017, 2018, there were just two wolves left. And those two wolves uh, were, were guaranteed to die without reproducing. Again, they would have gone extinct. And it led to quite a challenge for the National Park Service who it manages Isle Royale. And their challenge was what to do. Should they restore the wolf population? Should they, um, or, or just let it go? And, and one of the reasons that it was challenging for them is that the National Park is a you know, hundred year old institution and it has a philosophy of management. And its philosophy of management, well, is born from the early 20th century. And the idea was that a very important part of managing a national park is for humans to leave their hands off of it, to not intervene. And so some people interpreted non-intervention, that philosophy on Isle Royal for the case of wolves would mean that if they go extinct, that's just the way it goes and, and so be it. Um, other people said, that's fine if we lived in the early 20th century, 
when there are lots of what you might call wilderness areas or places that seem to be wilderness areas. But in the 21st century, in a world of climate change, if humans don't intervene to protect things, we're just going to ruin things even further and lose even more. And so the National Park Service, even still to this day, hasn't really fully come to grips with its relationship to climate change. And so that's why the, the, there's great challenge for Isle Royal National Park to figure out what to do. Eventually, they made the decision to bring wolves back. That was done in the year 2018, 2019 is was when wolves started to be reintroduced to the island. Uh, the reintroduction was very successful. Um, the population on Isle Royal right now is about 30 wolves. And uh, there are about a thousand moose. The moose are on the decline, which is a good thing because the moose have really done quite a bit of damage to the forest by now. And um, much of the book um, that is restoring the balance, I'm going to give you a screen share here now of, of the book cover in case you're interested to see that part. Um, much of the book, second half of the book anyways, is kind of discusses um, how it is that the wolf population kind of dwindled to its small numbers. It does that by following the lives of a handful of wolves uh, over about a decade long period. Uh, during that time, we had a couple of wolves that we could follow quite closely and could kind of tell the story of extinction th through their eyes in a sense. And then the chap the book also covers kind of the uh, philosophy about what might be the right thing to have done on Isle Royal. I happen to think it was the right thing to have brought wolves back. Um, and that's explained in the book as well as other people's views are explained in the book as well. And so um, anyways, that's a, a little uh, kind of a taste of the book with some readings and a little bit of kind of description of what's in the rest of it. Um, and I think at this point, I'm going to stop sharing the screen in just a moment. And I think we can turn it over to questions and answers. Happy to talk about questions about wolves on Isle Royal. Um, I live in Michigan, so I know a fair bit about wolves in Michigan in the Midwest. I know a fair bit about the Endangered Species Act as it relates to wolves. There's some stuff coming up soon about that that might be on your mind. So I'll feel free to ask any question. I'll do my best to answer them, uh, whatever they may be about. All right. That was so like wonderful to hear, to get some of those insights. Um, I just love hearing your perspective, John. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank that was you great. It was here real, today. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Yeah. Well, folks, um, I have some questions in the Q&A that I will start going through, but I want to encourage everyone to keep adding some in there. Um, again, if we don't get to them today, I will try and save some of these. Um, and then get them, um, send them to John um, so that he can uh, address them for you in a follow-up blog. Um, so yep, so you can do that by just popping down um, at the bottom of your screen. There's a little Q&A button um, and pop your question in there. All right. Uh, speaking of the Endangered Species Act and some of the stuff that's going on, um, Lisa asks, what can we do to get um, them, meaning wolves, um, listed again and stop the Hideous Great Lakes Wolf Recovery Act and the Trust the Science Act. Right. Well, um, you know, this is a, a question a little bit about kind of advocacy and mobilization. And there's an important way in which Kelly and some of her colleagues are probably better judges of like exactly what actions to take. I can tell you a couple of things that are maybe just uh, well suited for me to say anyways. Um, in, in Michigan, um, there is uh, just emerging uh, uh, kind of a grassroots political uh, action to protect wolves in Michigan. Um, I think if you just stay tuned into your regular kind of inter news or internet kind of channels and so forth, you'll you'll see that. Look for um, look for leads from the Humane Society of the United States. They're doing quite a bit of work in Michigan. I think they're going to be effective. Um, and then also the Anishinaabe uh, community in Michigan, that's the Native American group that lives in Michigan. Um, they also are quite active. If you just keep your antenna kind of tuned in for that, I would say over the next month, you'll start to see some action and uh, see opportunities to jump in. Um, the other thing that I think I would make a kind of a broad comment about the Endangered Species Act, I'm sure that, well, many of you may or may not know, wolves can be managed at one of two levels, at the federal level or at the state level. And while wolves are protected by the Endangered Species Act, they can't be hunted in any state where they're protected by the Endangered Species Act. So there's kind of a two-step concern here. One is, 
are wolves protected in any particular region by the Endangered Species Act? And if so, okay. If not, why not? Is that the right choice? If they're not protected or if they're not going to be protected, then of course, one's attention goes to the state level because then the states are going to typically ask the question, should we hunt? They have a tendency to say yes. And so they end up being kind of different political battles. They end up being, they have a different flavor for like what the issues are. And I want to say something about the Endangered Species Act, the federal level. One of the things that's going to happen is that in February of 2024, coming February coming up here, the Fish and Wildlife Service is expected to make a new decision about wolves. It's a court ordered decision. I have a feeling they'll be late in making the decision because they usually are. But nevertheless, that's planned as February. And that's something to keep your eyes on. But, but please do know this, the issue in February is not going to be about whether wolves are hunted or not. That's not like legally the concern. And I would even say philosophically the concern for the Fish and Wildlife Service or the Endangered Species Act. The concern is, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because it's easily kind of underappreciated. The Endangered Species Act has to ask this question. What is an endangered species? If you can answer the question, what is an endangered species? It's relatively easy to figure out whether wolves or any other species fit that definition. The real trouble with the endangered species right now, it's like it's virtually a crisis, I would say, is that no one knows what it means to be an endangered species. It's kind of an abstract sort of an idea. Like we know that we know that panda bears are endangered, tigers are endangered. Robins are not, squirrels are not. So we know what's endangered and what isn't, but there's a large number of species that are maybe like right on the cusp. Wolves are definitely one of them, but there are many others where it's like, hmm, are they endangered or not? And so one of the challenges that we have as an American people is to be able to answer the question, what is an endangered species? If we can answer that question, we'll know whether wolves should be endangered or not. And uh, again, the, the, the lawsuits, that have taken place over the past 20 years pertaining to this issue really um, just shine a bright light on the fact that we don't know the answer to that question. It's kind of a shame. So anyway, so there's a little bit about Endangered Species Act and a little bit of wolf politics. Yeah, no, I agree. That's definitely a murky piece of the law that leads to a lot of problems and can allow some of this, you know, back and forth. And as you were saying, which is the Endangered Species Act isn't asking should these animals be hunted or not, it's asking if they should be endangered or not. We yeah. as a society should also be thinking big picture of are we, why are we hunting carnivores in the first place, right? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of your readings speak to that of, you know, these are, these are individuals with lives, with, with, you know, just their own sense of being and worthiness. And why are we out there trophy hunting these magnificent animals that, you know, beyond just their ability to, to live and breathe, which they deserve that ability and that, that right. Yeah. Um, contribute so much to our own health and well-being. So I agree. That's a great question we need to be thinking about. We're getting lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to try and answer some or ask some the best I can, guys. Yeah. Um, we got 15 minutes here left. Um, so this one goes back to that first reading where you were describing um, the moose and wolf hunt. We had a couple questions. Um, Kelly asked, do you know how many wolves were involved in that hunt? Oh, I'm going by memory here because that was a long time ago for me. But there would have been like um, six or eight wolves. Uh, we're in Chippewa Harbor Pack at that time. And the thing to appreciate about how it is that wolves hunt moose is that you, I'm sure you all know that they live in family groups that we call as packs. Um, but not all the wolves in a pack are equal. Many wolves in a pack are uh, just offspring from that very year. And by the, the, and the, the scene I was describing took place in the winter time. And so in the winter time, wolves, wolf pups are, you know, like nine months old, eight months old, something like that. And if just a casual look, an eight or nine month old wolf looks like a full grown wolf. They're a little bit smaller, but, but they're, you know, they kind of look like a full size wolf. And so they, they look like an adult, um, but, they, but they have so little experience, these young wolves. And, and they're basically not good at hunting. And they sometimes even like get in the way, so to speak, because they're super excited about all that's going on. Their parents are all in a, in a tizzy about it and everybody's breathing hard and running and, and that sort of thing. Very excitable moments, of course. Um, and these young wolves kind of sometimes get in the way. The point that I'm making is that even though there may be six, eight wolves in a pack, often it's the case that one or two wolves is, is really, especially when it comes to a big prey like moose, one or two wolves is actually 
doing most of the work. And it's such a remarkable thing. A wolf may weigh 80, maybe 100 pounds. Isle Royal moose weigh, you know, 800 pounds, 900 pounds. So think for a moment about the idea of killing something that weighs 10 times as much as you do, and you're going to do it with your teeth. I mean, it's just mind boggling, really. And to think that that's how you make your living. And if you can't do that, you're, you, you starve to death. So uh, anyway, so that was a little little extra answer to the simple question about how many wolves were there. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, Rachel has um, another question about that hunt. Um, she says, um, am I to understand that the calf needs to learn that the mama will fight on the baby's behalf, speaking to the moose, um, rather than, than to exhaust itself running from the pack? I'm surprised the pack gave up once the running stopped. Yeah, sure. Uh, great questions. And so... You know, moose are like humans. We're not all good at what we're supposed to be good at. <laughs> some of us are better at what we do and some of us not as good as what we do or are supposed to do. And, and so calves and their mothers are really quite varied about how good they are, the calves at how good they are, of what they're supposed to do, which is to stay close to their mother. But they're still got a terror ridden mind at that moment. And then and then we have the cows, the mothers, they're also quite varied in their skill of being able to stay between the wolf pack and the, and the calves. And, and the thing to appreciate is that um, for about half of the year, calves are the primary food source for wolves. But enough calves are also born that the population keeps persisting. So, it's a, so the survival of a calf is really quite varied and it's tied to this variability and their ability to, to, to do things. Um, there was a second little part of the question, I think, but I forgot just right at the very end. Um, Rachel as or said, I'm surprised the pack gave up once oh, they the gave running up, yeah. stopped. Yeah. So here's the, the giving up part is that um by the time that uh moose decides to stop running and then turn and face the wolves, it, it's a actually pretty tough gig for the wolves. Um, and, and so their chances of getting injured at that point are really relatively high and their chance of just overall failing uh, to kill the moose are, are fairly high at that point. And the wolves have enough experience knowing that, that they just give up. And again, these are these injuries. They're not just little cuts and bruises and stuff like this. These are cracked ribs. These are cracked craniums that can uh, that can kill a wolf. And so they're, they're quite sensitive about kind of picking their options. I, I used to know the numbers right off the top of my head, but it, it's something like for every 10 attempts that a wolf pack makes, they only are successful once. So they, they're, they're used to failing, <laughs> but they just make it happen by just trying a lot. Yeah. And that's, that's true for, I know for a lot of our, um, our carnivores and predators yeah. that, yeah, they're just, when we talk to people about coyotes, it's, it's a similar thing of, you know, people have this vision that coyotes will be going after big cattle and, and, and they might, if they've got a pack, but oftentimes, you know, in a healthy population, they'll go after the smaller animals. It's a lot less risk. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Andrew asked, um, can the balance of nature better be described as a dynamic shifting equilibrium? Yeah, sure. And I think it's important to understand that balance of nature and that, to my knowledge, that phrasing has been used just like that balance of nature back to Greek antiquity. And, and it gets translated into, into English that way from what otherwise would have just been oral tradition. So I think it's important to understand that phrase balance of nature. It's extremely old. So the Cherokee who have mythologies uh, about uh, a prehistoric Cherokee, now I'm talking about, have mythologies about balance of nature. They didn't have that language dynamic equilibrium, right? It wasn't in their vocabulary. So I think that um, balance of nature is such a beautifully flexible term that uh, it can take on different meanings over literally the centuries. I think that's why it's an idea that endures and an idea that 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 sticks with us uh, is is because it changes. So the short answer is yes. I think that's a very useful way to think of balance of nature. I think I think it's just one of several useful ways, though. Yeah, humans and our need to quantify and qualify and put things in boxes. Yes, yes, makes us so good and makes us so bad. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> 
We had somebody ask um, in reference to when you were looking at those genetics um, and what some of the inbreeding and where some of the genetics had come from. They asked what methodology you used to find out about those issues. Um, was it hair snags? Was it necropsies? How were you doing that? Yeah. So for the um, so for the wolf genetics, uh, the the most important source of information is moose. Uh, sorry, as a uh, wolf poop. <laughs> and so what we would do and still do is um, in the wintertime when we're doing our surveys, counting the wolves and the moose, we're also looking for places where wolves have killed moose. And when wolves kill a moose, because the moose are so big, it takes the wolves a while to feed on them, three or four, five days. And when they're eating all of that, remember that's 900 pounds of food, they poop it all out. And so there's poop all over the place. And so what we do is after the wolves have left uh, a kill site, we land the plane in the nearest frozen lake that we can find strap on our snowshoes, hike in, perform a necropsy on the moose to better understand its circumstances. And then it's like, I don't know, Santa Claus or something like that, have a big old garbage bag and a box full of Ziploc bags. And we go around and collect the poop and throw it in what, again, it looks like a bag of Christmas presents, I suppose, when we're all done, it's slung over our shoulders. And uh, anyways, we, you know, I mean, we've collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scats and from those scats, you can get DNA. And from a DNA, you can get what's basically like a DNA fingerprint. So you can tell one wolf from another. And not only can you tell one wolf from another individually, but you can also tell who's the parent of whom. And then you can start to figure out, oh, gosh, here's a wolf that doesn't have any parents. Must have come from Canada. Stuff like that. That's interesting. Um, da, da, da. Um, so how did you guys reintroduce wolves to Eye Royale? And one second, I think there's another question um, about that as well. Um, but go ahead and, and then I'll ask this follow-up question. How, how did you go about reintroducing the wolves? Right. So the wolf reintroduction was uh, designed and managed, implemented by the National Park Service. And they uh, live captured wolves from Michigan, Minnesota, and Ontario. And uh, and then after live capturing there, uh, transported them to Isle Royal, um, and then uh, in cages, and um, and then and then released them. Um, you know, wolf well introductions of any kind um, are very much in. I mean, they were equal parts art and science, and so you know the decisions for how to do it were informed by uh, good science and also kind of tailored to specific circumstances on Isle Royal that for which there science doesn't have a lot to say about, but you just got to figure out how we're going to do this. And uh, so it really needs to be said with some thankfulness that it turned out very well, because it doesn't always turn out well. Some introductions uh, are a failure and you have to like try a second time, sometimes have to try a third time. So this one was very, very fortunate that it happened well on the first occasion. Yeah. And so following up with that, um, Jane asked um, if what and if there were any specific issues in this particular relocation, um, where did the wolves come from? And then is 30 believed to be the carrying capacity um, for the wolves on Isle Royale? Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there wasn't really anything noteworthy to talk about here about, you know, challenges to it all. I mean, there were logistical challenges just like for any any operation and they weren't mine. So they're not for me to speak about probably. Um, and then so um, it's 30, it's th th 30, 31 wolves. That's how many are there right now. Is that the carrying capacity? Is that the right number? You know, um, 30 is about as many as you would expect to see on Isle Royal. In, in the past decades, we have occasionally seen more than 30, but never for very long and never by very many. And we made reference a few minutes ago about dynamic equilibrium. That's probably a better way to think about the like the right number of wolves on Isle Royal. And so the, the right number of wolves on Isle Royal is, is undoubtedly going to fluctuate. I would say it would tend to fluctuate between about I don't know, 18 and, and 30 wolves, something like that. And, and just to to maybe appreciate one more detail. And this is very sciencey and at risk of being wonky, but it might be, there's a little bit of uh, Eastern thought here for sure, is that an ecosystem can be described by one of two things, the technical word for it are states and processes. So states are, how many are there? What is the state of the population? 
And the processes are the things that connect them. And the processes are things like predation rate and kill rate. Think of it as like a flow. It's how much flow of energy and material there is from one population to the next. The measurement of that is very abstract, very sciencey, but we actually can do it very well. And that rate of flow is probably a better way to answer the question like what's normal on Isle Royale? And there, something like, to be exceedingly precise and quantitative, if the predation rate on Isle Royale is somewhere between about seven and 12%, that's probably a more reliable indicator of things are happening kind of as we come to understand and expect. And so anyway, states and processes, processes are like a flow of energy and material from one state to the next, actually a very Eastern idea, but actually Western science is all over it. Yeah, like that. Yeah, that's definitely a different way than, similar, but different way than we're kind of yeah. taught in some of that wildlife yeah. biology population dynamics that I know some of us have taken or read about. Yeah. And I love numbers, but sometimes there's an obsession over how many are there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Trust me. My is one of my master's is in environmental economics, which is all about the numbers and oh, how influence the numbers. So yeah. I hear you there. <laughs> um, we'll go with one last question. And this one's kind of more, um, uh, I don't know, ethical or thinking about thoughts and emotional processes. Um, but we had someone write in and say, it is sad that we try to wipe out species such as the wolves and coyotes. Then we try to intervene and bring them back. Then they just get hunted or removed because of people. What do we see as being the point in this process? Um, how can we um, break this process and kind of end some of this suffering? Yeah. Um, I mean, if I had the answer, um, <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't. I might not be sitting in this this humble office. Um, I can probably only add to the question, which is to say that um, there are a variety of like Western ways of, of looking at the relationship between humans and nature. And some, not all, some of these Western ways are very much about um, controlling and dominating and exploiting nature. One of the, we need to find alternatives. And I think, you know, Project Coyote represents an important alternative for kind of a, a philosophy for how to relate to nature. One that I appreciate um, is what the Anishinaabe people think about their relationship with wolves in particular. Um, the Anishinaabe people are people who lived in the upper Midwest for a, a while before Europeans came. And their mythology story, their, their I'm sorry, their creation story involves uh, wolves. And in that creation story, without telling it all now, because time is short, they believe that, that they are a brother and sister with the wolf, that, that the Anishinaabe people and wolves are brother and sister. And they don't believe that like symbolically, they believe that literally. And for those of you who may be Catholic or know a little bit about Catholicism, they believe it in the same way that a Catholic believes that the Eucharist is actually the body of Christ. Catholics don't believe that symbolically, they believe that literally. And the Anishinaabe believe that in the same way, that they're, that they're siblings with wolves. That is an idea that is very consistent with Western thought because all you need to do is know a little bit of Darwin and kind of understand that, well, siblings, actually a pretty flexible term, just means that you have relations. And we certainly have relations that go back, we gotta go back a little further. And so, but here's the, here's the point about this relationship is that what's the right way to relate to a sibling? If you have a sibling, you know the answer to that is complicated. Yes. But it's not a relationship of exploitation. It's not a relationship of domination. Uh, and I think it's not well described by really like any other relationship. Sibling relationships can't be compared to anything else. They're so varied and unique and dynamic and changing from case to case. In any case, I think the beginning of the answer is to think of our relationship with nature, the denizens of nature, there are siblings. And so how do you relate to your sibling? And um, I think I'll just leave it at that. No, I love that. That is that is great. You know, as I have two siblings, 
And there's been times where my younger brother and I, we, our parents never thought we'd get along, right? Um, there was lots of back and forth. There was love there, but it was push and pull. And as we've gotten older, we have a much more in touch, um, you know, relationship where he gets to do his own thing. He, I have my own space. It is, we're, we're learned to coexist and then evolve from coexistence into love and compassion. And so I can definitely see how moving human society into a similar framework would be a wonderful way forward. And it's easy to remember to strike up a conversation because you just say, hey, shouldn't our relationship with nature be like that with our siblings? And then, wow, you're going to have any kind of conversation going any direction, like with any pretty, you have to have special knowledge. You don't have to have a certain political orientation. You can just say, what if? Right. It's kind of one of those, um, when I was trained in interpretation, we call them universal truths or universal concepts, right? That even if you don't have siblings, because of media and everything else, you know about siblings, right? And so it's something that most most people will be able to connect and think about. So I, I love that. That's a wonderful answer. Yeah, thank All you. right. Well, we are a little over time. Um, so that will have been our final question. Um, we have almost 30 questions that were asked um, just in the Q&A. Um, so again, I have saved, I think, all of those now. I will go through um, and send a lot of those over to John. Um, this is um, has been recorded. Um, I'm going to send this to our media specialist, um, Sarah. She's going to get this all cleaned up. She's going to get little title bars and things put on. Um, and then we will be sharing that definitely on the Heartland Rewilding Project Coyote YouTube channels, um, out through shows, socials. And then um, we plan to send to everyone um, a, a email that will have links to all of our presentations that have been part of this series. It was so wonderful getting to meet John and all of our other presenters. I had a wonderful time this spring and summer uh, meeting all of you, exploring these wonderful topics. So thank you everyone for joining us for the Connect the Heartland webinar series. And I hope to see you in many more of our future virtual events and even some live ones. Thanks guys. Bye. Thanks everyone.